Hey everyone, welcome to episode 4 of the Inner Sanctum, the one and only dark ambient variety show here on YouTube. Um, it's been a cold, grim, rainy weekend here in Wisconsin. It felt like a good time to get out a dark ambient classic I hadn't listened to in a long time. Actually, a couple years. Um, you know, when it comes to weather like this, I just... I don't know, there's something special about the rain. I've always felt a connection to it. I can't really explain that, but... You know, the rain makes a lot of people feel miserable, but it's kind of something that makes me feel happy. It has such a strange atmospheric connection to me, and I can't really put that in perspective, but I've always connected gloomy, rainy days with uh, music of all sorts. Oftentimes dark candy music, but also like black metal and just really anything that's just dark and grim and, you know, character. So I started searching around this area of my CD shelf earlier today, and I noticed that I hadn't listened to Savartzen's classic Traces of Nothingness from 2005. Savartzen is a long-running project of Jan Roger Peterson from Trondheim, Norway, and uh, he's part of that sort of, I guess, second or third wave of dark ambient arts that came out in the late 90s along with artists like Kammerheit and Norfont. Savartzen was formed in 1999 by Jan Roger Peterson in Trondheim, Norway, and over the years he's released five albums, so not necessarily the most prolific artist, but he's been noted for his absolutely dark, bleak compositions. Svartzen is actually a Swedish word, it means black mind, and that's sort of a pretty good way to put, uh, you know, Jan's music into perspective. It's just black and just as dark as things get. I mean, uh, this is pretty much dark, dark Yandy music in its most basic form. But don't let me alarm you and, uh, you know, let you think that that means it's boring, because it's quite the opposite. This is just really meditative, relaxing, bleak, obscure music that, you know, takes you to this sort of nightmarish realm, but it's not really sort of nightmarish realm where, like, your, um, you know, the hairs on your arms would stand on it. It's got a certain atmosphere. It's just, uh, it's soothing in a way. I've listened to this album, you know, while reading, writing stories, and just chilling out and calming myself in tense, you know, in situations when I'm having anxiety or, you know, near panic attacks, stuff like that. You know, it's been a really, uh, meditative and I think uh, medicinal sort of element, if you can believe that. <laughs> That's one of the really great things I think about dark candy music, especially when it's more, you know, basic and sort of bare bones, there's not a lot of samples and, you know, you know, cinematic effects, that dark candy music can really just be the soothing, healing thing, and I think a lot of people, you know, use it for just that, you know. I bought this album in 2007, and it was two years after it actually came out, and, you know, I remember I bought this for rather cheap. I think I bought it from the End Records website, which is a heavy metal label. They were selling it for like ten dollars or something like that. And I had already heard Safarsen years earlier in the Nord Ambient Alliance compilation, but I just sort of slept on actually buying any of his other albums. I had, think I had heard them from some MP3s, a few songs here and there, but I wasn't able to get the first ones. I still don't own them, but I have heard them in full sense on like. You know, on YouTube and Spotify for them, and they're great records, but I think it was really on this album where he, you know, really just everything came full circle and he made his masterpiece. And I mean, that's not to take anything away from what he's done, you know, before or since then. Everything he's done is really fantastic. The guy just doesn't really make bad albums. He's just, you know, it's that same sort of style, just that, of just, you know, constant quality, like Northaunt and, uh, Kammerhart and Atrium Cars, who just continuously make great records. These guys don't have a, you know, Nothing bad comes out of these guys. It's all just really great music. Perfect dark ambient music. There isn't really any special track that stands out on this album. I think the whole thing as a whole, from start to finish, is just really magnificent. Um, it's just really just one of those albums that, you know, you can just really lose yourself in. It's, you know, it's... I don't think there really is a song that can really... You know, you can say, like, I love this song more than the other. I don't know if you could really do that with some arts and music. Not too much, anyway. Um, but yeah, he's, uh... This is some of the best stuff you're going to hear out there, just as far as basic, straightforward, dark ambient music goes. And, uh, if you can get this out, I highly recommend it. I would have to guess it's out of print by a label. But you know how these things are. Check Discogs, check eBay, and hopefully the price isn't ridiculous. I read on Cyclic Law's website that this was essentially the final item in a trilogy that began on the, the artist's earlier albums. I mean, all this, all the first three albums all deal with darkness in very special ways, and I'm told this was like sort of the, the album where Jan just accepted the darkness of life, and you know this is his reaction to it, and uh, I mean that seems you know a pretty good way to you know describe the album too. This is just you know accepting the melancholy, the bleakness of life. You know, I mean not everyone is, 
that's, it's just, everyone doesn't perceive the world in the same way, and that's something, you know, when you have depression and other mental disorders, you know, a lot of people don't understand that, you know? A lot of famous people kill themselves, and, you know, people that, you know, seemingly have it together and think they just go, oh, that person could have, you know, gotten help and whatever else, but that's the thing, is when you have depression and you have that bleak state of mind, it, there's just, it's hopeless, you know, you can't just, you know, flick a switch and be good one day, you know, you can't put on your happy face and go face the world, because no matter what you do, the world just fucks with you, and you can't, you know, find that happiness and that, you know, acceptance of the world that everyone else can, you know, and... I mean, that's something I've had to deal with my life, too. I mean, I'm going to be 37 years old in two months, and I'm still... It's been a continuous process for me to try to just, you know, move away from the darkness of sorts. But, I mean, I think, like, I need the darkness just to, you know, balance myself. It's just a part of me. It's, it always has been. I've been listening to dark music since I was about 10 years old. You know, it began stuff with, you know... Like bands as simple as like The Cure back then and Pink Floyd. I mean, you you know, you think about those just in generally speaking, those bands ain't that dark, but they have dark music. And that was the kind of stuff I first heard when I was 10 years old and I bought their records. So it's always been a part of me. And, you know, there's other artists too that when I was younger that I was into, like Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. They were one of my favorite artists when I was like 11, 12 years old. And then someone that I considered my hero blew his fucking brains out. And, you know, that has an effect on you. Because this was someone I idolized, and then he killed himself. I didn't necessarily understand. But as I got older, I understood that, you know, how bleak and sad life can be. And, you know, there was times where I almost considered the kind of things that he did, you know. And, I mean, I don't think I could ever take it to that far, because I'm not, I'm not that sad. Of, but, you know, there's that darkness in me, and it's, it's always there. And, you know, I mean, I... There's a part of me that hates it, there's a part of me that loves it, because it's just who I am. And I think, you know, Jan Roger Peterson, he has that in him, and it just shows so well in this music, and it's just, it's who he is, and it comes out just magnificently in this album. I mean, this is a one-of-a-kind album, just, you know. I mean, his other albums, they're great, I love them, they are fantastic, but this is just something about this album that's just magnificent. It's obscure atmosphere and just special, and uh, I think it's just one of the best Dark Campaign records ever. So just to show you the packaging a little bit, it comes in this uh, poly sleeve, I believe they're called, plastic sleeve, I don't know, whatever. Uh, it comes in a so slightly oversized digipack. I think I can get a look at the front cover, actually, I'll take it out of there, you can check that out a little bit better. was the 13th cycle on Cyclic Law. Uh, worth mentioning that I think nowadays there are well over 100 releases, so this is still one of the early releases on Cyclic Law. And there's underneath the uh, DigiPack tray card. And I really like the artwork. I mean, it's black and white and very minimal, but it really fits the music, because Savartsen isn't overly cinematic in any way. It's not active. There's no percussion of any sort like that, and it's you know, it's music you can just really chill out to. But, I mean, I don't want to alarm anyone and think, like, this is, like, new age music or some of that, because it's definitely not. This is this is about as bleak as dark ambient music gets. I mean, this is just dark, dark, dark stuff here, you know? Savartsen is a journey into the darkest, bleakest caverns of the mind. A place where there's no hope, no light, and no hope place of return. This is just music to, you know, where... I wouldn't say it's suicidal, but it's just... This is kind of music you really just can just lose yourself when in and not in you know a good way or a bad way this is just this is bleak and this is dark as stuff gets and uh you know i think his only real rival as far as his kind of style is, is, is really would be like a artist like lost you know and i mean this is just slow paced dreary painful stuff in a way i mean i would think this music's kind of you know, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's a, you know, a gateway into his soul, his mind. I don't know. Maybe it's just the type of music he likes to create. It's hard to say. But this is just really special music. I can't really even put it into perspective. That's, I guess, kind of the toughest thing about dark game music. It is tough to review because there's not necessarily those, you know, melodic or rhythmic kind of parts that, you know, are, in, you know, present in normal songs. So that's what makes it tough. But, you know, as I've often said, atmosphere is everything. And this stuff is so rich with atmosphere. But, you know, it's just that super dark, dark as fuck atmosphere that just really overtakes you and just takes your mind, takes your soul, your body, everything to this world, this land where just there's no hope. 
it just completely consumes you with darkness, and there's just no light at the end of the tunnel, I guess is the best way I can put it. So, you know, it's a journey, and even one you might want to take very often, but it's one I really like, and uh, this is a great record. So, Hearts and Traces of Nothingness. Next up is an album that's, for me personally, it's one of my all-time favorite records, and it's not a very... Not a very actually dark ambient sounding record, but it has dark ambient characteristics, so that's why I'm going to talk about it here in the Inner Sanctum. Um, the record in question is Nothing's The Grey Subaudible. The Grey Subaudible was, was released on Ibon Records back in 2000, and it's the personal project of Jason William Walton, who you may know as the bass player from Egalock. Uh, Nothing was a project he did from 1997 until about 2004, 2005, when Egalock started to take off and really get popular, and I'm assuming he just didn't have enough time to really keep up with Nothing, so it got on the back burner and it eventually uh, ceased to exist. Uh, there could be a few other reasons for that, most notably because one of these, there's also several other projects called Nothing. I think uh, nowadays there's like a post-rock shoegaze band used in name, it's pretty popular, so that's probably another reason why the band eventually disappeared. But uh, it was his project for quite a few years, and I think he was probably the first person to use the name of Nothing. Nothing was a really interesting project because it covered a lot of ground during the years it was active. Um, you get everything from like power electronics to ambient noise to dark ambient to neoclassical to uh, even like just kind of unidentifiable just experimental electronic. I don't really know how to put it in perspective. Just experimental seems like the best way to really uh, sum it up. Um, there's lots also a bit of percussion and beats and uh, a lot of narration, even some scream and yell vocals. So it's really a that demands your attention. It's not, you know, something you can zone out to, it's not relaxing, it's actually a very active, but it does have slow moments too. Um, it opens up with a song called To Draw the Things, and this song was actually wrote by the ambient uh, noise power electronics band called Grunt Splatter, I don't know if you guys have heard of them, and uh, it, from there it goes into the first song, Working Through the Nail, and this is where you really get a good glimpse of what nothing is all about. I mean, this is this track just has like, like I said, dark ambient, um, you know, neoclassical, lots of melodic synths and beats and percussion and narration and a lot of melodic elements and it's just, it's a really, I don't know, it's hard to put it into perspective because it's just a really, really experimental song and I mean the whole album is, it's, it has a unique atmosphere, it's honestly like nothing else I've ever heard before and there's not too many albums out there I can really say that about, but this is one of those albums where it's just really, it sounds totally unique, I don't know how else to say it. Um, there's so much going on, it's, but it's not like so much going on that you can't keep up with it, you can't identify it, I guess. But this is an album I bought back in 2001, and you know, I, I think back in 2001 is a time period in my life when I was just buying just a lot of music. I mean, just every type of music I could think of, because I'd only gotten into like kind of the metal underground and, you know, uh, like kind of the dark music underground in general, only about two or three years earlier. So, yeah, I mean, I just remember that year was kind of like when I, you know, I probably got my first credit card or something like that, and I was just buying crazy, off, crazy stuff off the internet and stuff like that. And this was one of the albums I bought back in 2001, and you know, it's an album I've held down to for 17 years now. I mean, it's just one of my absolute favorites. This is a record that moves from both fast to slow, and it's, you know, it's a record you really gotta pay attention to. The others, I think you're gonna miss. Them. So a lot going on. You may miss some, you know, uh, melodic element if you zone out or whatever. You might miss sort of the whole concept of what's going on if you don't pay attention to the lyrics too. So it's highly advised what you read it with the book that you can, at least for the first couple times you listen to the record, I would think. Again, it's a pretty hard record to, to describe, because just experimental electronics just seems like the best way to really sum it up. I mean, kind of think of a mixture of, like, Rosanda Atri, Lycia, uh, various noise ambient projects, and... I don't know, it's just, you know, any kind of weird, like, like experimental electronic stuff from, like, the 80s kind of seems like the influence here. You know, maybe something as uh, weird as, like, Swans was an influence. It's really kind of hard to pinpoint it, but this is a record I just absolutely love, and I mean, I, it's hard for me to talk about it because it just, it really means a lot to me, and it's, I, I mean, I, I guess that's what all, you know, all really great records, seems it's just kind of hard to pinpoint why exactly you like it. But to me, this record sounds very unique all these years later, and I think it's an album that everyone should really hear, especially if you're just into really dark experimental stuff. But anyway, here is the front cover. Hope of relief begins to die. And a little back. Interestingly, I think the front cover is 
Jason on the cover here, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, this picture originally was used as an Eagle Lock promo back in 1998 when he first joined the band, but maybe Jason can correct me if I'm wrong there. So there's the inside of this digipack. And the CD. Comes this pretty nice digipack with a pull-out booklet. There's behind the booklet. And uh, the lyrics are really interesting because they basically talk of like plague and pestilence, I guess, and basically living with uh, disease and infection and just becoming the host of a virus. It's really interesting. I mean, it's uh, the way they wrote is just really kind of poetic and really just really gripping the way it's wrote. It just kind of, you know, talks about someone succumbing to disease and living through it, I guess, is basically the best way I can sum it up. It's my interpretation of it. Yeah, the album was recorded way back in 1999, so it's, you know, the recordings themselves are pretty darn old, almost 20 years now. And there's the back cover. Uh, Jason, of course, is the man standing in the back in this photo, and the other guy here is Nick Ryan Loyacano, and he just provides some additional keyboards and vocal narration on two of the tracks. And, uh, yeah, this is just a really great record. It's experimental electronic, I mean, it's probably the best way to sum it up. It's, it will appeal to dark young fans, just dark music fans in general. This is a great record. I mean, it's hugely influential, influential to me. It's the, the shame, you know, and people don't talk about this rock anymore. It really deserves the attention. I do believe the album is still in print from the label. You can also usually score a copy off of Discogs for like six or seven dollars, which is a huge, awesome deal because this album is worth so much more than it. But I guess it's just it's one of those obscure gems that just was, uh, doomed to be underground forever, I guess. I don't know how else to put it. Uh, it also was more recently released on cassettes. I think that was back in 2013, got a cassette reissue. The new layout, a new remastering by Jason himself, but I do believe that cassette is also sold out. So it might be hard to get a copy. But if all else fails, I guess, go with this original copy. If I want to pay too much, it's highly, highly advisable to do this. This is a fantastic record. And true that it's not the most, you know, dark ambient record, and I guess I am kind of diverging from my own theme here a little bit, but I just, no one else is going to talk about this show, or at, no one else is going to talk about this album on their blog, so I have to talk about it, and it's just, it's a great album, it's one of my all-time favorites, and uh, I highly recommend you check it out, uh, that's nothing to the degree of audible. A month or so ago, I was contacted by a man named Arvo Zylo, who was pretty much offering to send me just about any release on his label that I wanted to have for review here on the Inner Sanctum. Um, when I started to kind of dig into their releases, I found that they were more noise and power electronics kind of stuff, with very minimal dark ambient characteristics. And when I really started to think about it, I wasn't really sure if this was going to work out for the Inner Sanctum. And then uh, he brought to my attention one of the artists on his label called Wilt. And when I checked out Wilt, I was actually really impressed. And I said, hey, if you want to send this over, that'd be great. I will definitely review it. Wilt is a long-running project that, uh, depending on where you look on the internet, is either from Chicago, Illinois, or Wisconsin. And if this guy is from Wisconsin, I'd sure like to find them and do some dark music together, because I really like this CD. Um, the CD that No Part of It Records sent me was called Nocturnal Requiem, and it's one of several albums this artist has released since the late 90s. I mean, this guy's had tons of full-length albums, EPs, splits over the years. He's been a very busy artist. And uh, I guess originally this project was a duo between uh, James P. Keller and Dan Hall. But uh, at least on this record, it is just James P. Keller. And uh, probably the sound of this record, probably the best way to describe it, to call it something like noise, dark ambient. Basically think of like kind of a quieter version of Brighter Death Now, MZ412, and IRM mixed with a very kind of dark, really intimidating uh, dark ambient music. You can have a pretty good idea what this album sounds like. I mean, this is like total nightmarish territory kind of stuff, intermingled with those harsher frequencies, experimental tendencies. So it really is a really engaging release. Um, I would say the only thing the release kind of suffers from is it's not diverse enough. I would have liked to have seen 
crafts some melodic qualities in it. It's just really kind of just really specific on just uh, focusing on the noise year and experimental tendencies and just the real dark droning stuff. But it would have been really great if there was something more melodic, like a piano line or just a piano, you know, a, a, a more melodic kind of you know, droning atmosphere to it. But they really don't get that. But what I do like about it, it's really oppressive and just really dark. So if you're just in the mood for something that's just, you know, intimidating and just, you know, you really just have to go to that dark place and this is, you know, this is one of the great records you can really use for that kind of thing. So here's the front cover. Um, the front cover is actually a painting by James P. Keeler. And, Uh, Arvo also sent to me some stickers. He also, this is really interesting. He sent me a letter, which was actually done on a typewriter. <laughs> That's pretty cool, and I gotta say that actually is a really interesting aesthetic because uh, I haven't personally owned a typewriter or a like word processor kind of device in like these 20 years, so when I opened up the envelope and saw that, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool, actually. It's very old school and nostalgic looking. I mean, I remember when I was, like, a little kid, like, writing up stories on this, like, typewriter, word processor kind of thing we had, and, uh, yeah, same thing. I would print them up in paper like that, so it's pretty funny to open up and see that and cool. So, so yeah, if you're into any sort of, like, kind of minimal noise and dark yanny music, this is definitely an album I can recommend. Like I said, it's not very melodic, but it definitely holds your attention for its hour or so duration, and it is just a really great journey to down a really dark path. I mean, it's got a lot of those old cold meat industry vibes and just real kind of, you know, not too abrasive, but abrasive and, you know, dark ambient territory that can really just, you know, take you someplace special or someplace horrible and nightmare should be gone, too. I don't know. It's a cool record, though, so that's Wilt's Nocturnal Requiem. So shortly after I got in contact with Arvo Zylo from No Part of the Records, he just kind of disappeared off of Facebook. His page was deleted and everything. And originally, I thought maybe, like, he got a Facebook uh, banning or whatever, because I think sometimes it happens when you... You know, people post like offensive material or something like that. But it's been like a month now, and his profile still doesn't come back, so I don't know what happened. So, Arvo, if you see this and you're at least mostly happy with it, send me some sort of sign or something, or haunt my dreams or something, just so I know that you saw it, and then I can, then I can like rest peacefully and all that stuff. <laughs> so, anyway, Arvo also sent me some of the solo art, his uh, album called Hello Walt. Um, I didn't originally ask him to send me this, but he did it anyway, and I was mostly just planning on just reviewing the, the Wilt album, but since he did send me this, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, probably the best way I could describe the solo work in Hello Walls is that it's just, uh, I guess, experimental noise music. Um, a lot of the, you know, kind of characteristics that you'd expect to be in an experimental release are there. I mean, it's there's abrasive moments there, it's just weird, odd, off-the-wall moments. There's some, you know, dark ambient characteristics, too, and, uh, it, it's just a lot of it's kind of really hard to describe. I mean, I'm not a really, really a seasoned pro with experimental music, but I do like experimental music to an extent. But as usual, I kind of like to, you know, have some sort of melodic quality of just really a rich atmosphere, which it doesn't really have, but, you know, it's still interesting really, so it's cool checking it out, and, I mean, well, the other stuff is pretty cool too. I just, I don't know. I'm not really a seasoned pro with the noise and the our electronic kind of stuff, kind of stuff. So it's not really, you know, my expertise. It's kind of hard for me to talk about it. But I will say this, you know, this release and a lot of the other stuff on the No Part of the Records uh, Bandcamp, it really is interesting. So if you're into that scene and you're into that kind of stuff, I would highly recommend checking out because what I heard did sound cool. It's just not really like my cup of tea, and I don't really know how to. You know, really just kind of talk about it and, you know, give it, um, you know, positive reviews and, you know, stuff like that. Just something I haven't really been able to get into. It's, it is a genre of music that I, I've listened to for well over 15 years now. Well, sporadically over the last 15 years. It's just over that time period, I'm always just kind of left scratching my head thinking like, well, I kind of like this, but I'm not sure if I like this. And coming back to that kind of music was kind of hard for me because like I said there's generally not those melodic qualities or anything really that's like catchy or anything like you might 
might find in some other music. I mean, even dark ambient music has catchy qualities sometimes, you know, or memorable moments. And I don't really get that so much from power electronics or uh, noise music so much. Maybe some people do. I mean, I know there's people out there who literally, literally listen to that stuff, like, as their favorite genre of music. So if you're one of those people, you know, I would highly recommend looking up no part of its records website because they got a lot of cool stuff on there. And, uh, you know, Hello Walls is probably a real cool record. I think you're going to look, you know, if you're in that kind of scene, Stuff, you're probably gonna love it, but like, holy shit, this is a great record. So, anyway, here's the front cover of Arvo Zylo's Hello Walls. And the back cover. I'm kind of one page insert, and uh, you can see that. Um, there is only three songs on this record, but two of those three songs are over 30 minutes. The first song is actually 38 minutes, too. And uh, there is the CD. I kind of like the, the print on the CD. So, yeah, like I said, you know, experimental and noise stuff isn't really my territory, so I'm just going to say thank you, Arvo, for sending it. It's pretty cool. I will definitely keep it seated and continue to listen to it from time to time, as well as the Will City, which I actually like a lot. Well guys, it's turning out to be an episode riddled with missteps and divergencies. And you know, I'm not even sure if divergency is a real word, but I'm going to use it anyway in this context. At this point, I've taken away from the original Dark Gaming theme so much that I might as well just take it a step further. Oh yes, it's time we talk about Dungeon Synth Music. Released earlier this year and conjured forth in the land known as d it is Infernum's debut. Liviatio. Not to be confused with the Nazi metal band from the 90s named Infernum, this Infernum dwells from Deep Earth, also possibly Norway, also possibly California. And this is their debut album, well, EP actually, but in the Dungeon Synth world. Fall Nets of Music is like an album, I guess. I don't know how that works out. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna start talking normal now. That's getting really hard for me. Um, Infernum is a dungeon synth project, and if you're not familiar with dungeon synth music, it is a genre of music that was originally created in the early 90s by the elf master himself, Mortis. Um, throughout the 90s, it was sort of an underground enigma until just kind of recently it became this big thing. And if you pay attention to anything, and God knows I don't, uh, <laughs> dungeon, synth has got, dungeon synth has gotten really popular lately. Uh, I'm not really sure what the catalyst was, but uh, it was enough to make uh, Mortis actually like his old creations again and start performing live, and he's milking the shit out of that right now and touring the world like a king. Um, anyway, as a, as a result of, you know, Mortis kind of uh, rethinking his past, his past and uh, actually uh, admiring what he did back when he was a kid, uh, it's uh, inspired literally hundreds of youngsters and possibly uh, people over the age of 22 to uh, make uh, dungeon synth as well. Infernum, unlike Mortis and a lot of other dungeon synth projects, uh, it sounds like it takes more of their influence from soundtracks and video games, which I personally really like. I mean, Mortis himself uh, sounded very soundtrack and video game-ish, but the problem was after Mortis kind of became the uh, Godfather of the Dungeon Synth scene. There was a lot of projects that arose and really just wanted to copy. Infernum, this uh, debut four track set, is pretty cool stuff. It, it conjures up vibes of just like, classic video game soundtracks. Like I was reminded of like Castlevania with kind of the gothic overtones and stuff like that, and just really melodic kind of sounding stuff on this uh, this four track right here. And uh, there's a lot of like some percussion, kind of a ritualistic sound going on too. So it's really you um, know got sort of that, you know, ritualist to dark ambient vibe in a way, but also with like the melodic and kind of bouncy characteristics you find in like soundtrack music and just dungeon synth in general. It's a really cool release. 
Um, this particular album was released by Grey Matter Productions in a very limited quantity. I think it was like 30 cassette tapes and that was it. It sold out within like a matter of weeks. So here's the front cover. And it comes with this uh, just plain red tape. There's no print on the tape or anything like that. So it's very basic. Here is the inside of the back of the J card. Here you can see the inside. Music crafted in the dead of night during the chilled winter of 2018. Old dry vibrations formed with aid from the infernal necromancer of Diapath, Nidiad E2. This cassette also comes with a oh, about 6x8 booklet, which is a track by track guide giving you information on each song and what it's about. Oh, here is the front cover of the booklet. Mine, uh, unfortunately, took a little damage in the mail, but nothing too devastating. And the back cover of that. As I said, each, each uh, page kind of gives you a little insight into what each song is about and so on and so forth. I'm not sure if this is going to be a regular thing with each Inferno release so it's just a one time thing. But I'm guessing since there's that one in the corner there, it is going to be a regular thing with every release. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a pretty basic paper thing, but it'd be cool, like, if uh, in the future it was something more, a little more hardcover or something. I'm guessing he's probably kind of riding the vibes of the more just was trying to just kind of, you know, put a visual guide behind the whole thing, which is super cool, and I've honestly never seen anything exactly like this come with a release, so it's, you know, pretty cool, and it actually gave me uh, some ideas for my own music, so it's something maybe uh, not to look at. Um, as a final thought, I'm not really uh, a big fan of cassette tapes. I think they're kind of stupid, but I really like this music a lot enough that I had to buy it, so I did. And I mean, the only reason I really think cassettes are stupid is because, well, unlike a lot of like people that are in their 20s now, like, it's new and hip and cool and then retro, but like, I grew up with these stupid ass things, and I remember how stupid they were rewinding them all up and listening to the songs I like, and I don't know how many times I fucking stereo hate these things too, so I don't know. I mostly just bought it to support the artist, but I also did really genuinely like this album a lot, and it's highly recommended stuff. I mean, if you're done, this is one of the better releases I've heard in the past, I don't know, four or five months, and you know, there's just so much music coming that I've seen right now, it's impossible to keep up with the night, honestly, given on myself, so it's whatever it comes in the air is just, you know, pretty random at this point. But uh, I'm definitely going to follow this, uh, this artist because this is uh, someone I know, well not personally, but we've been in contact for quite a while now, he's a really cool dude, and uh, it's a really great project, and I'm not, I don't think I can say his name on here because I think he wants to remain anonymous, so I won't. But he also has a project called uh, Secret of the Forest, which is kind of similar, more of sort of a nature-based dungeon project there, and he also has an experimental project too, which is really cool worth checking out. But again, I'm not going to give too many details because he probably doesn't want to really have any information known, I think he uh, wants to remain this anonymous entity. So, if you are ready, go check on Infernum and enter the kingdom of Deepath. Not long ago, I came into contact with an artist from Washington named Infinexhuma. Infinexhuma basically means infinitely exhumed. Uh, the project has its roots which date back to about 2013, and the first album was released in 2016. It's called Chaotic Depth. But it was released just digitally and unmastered, so I think the artist sort of sees this as more of the demo than the actual first album. But then flash forward, or sorry, flash back to May of 2000 year when the artist released, I would say, his true debut album called Crossing. Crossing follows the afterlife of a physically manifested spirit which has been detached from its human, ho human host after suicide. So basically the whole theme of the album is, uh, the spirit which is in this transitional phase, just having just left its human host, and now seeking the afterlife. Um, through the, throughout the course of this record, uh, Infinite Exuma basically takes you on this journey that feels both human but also, uh, I would say fantasy, but in a non-hokey kind of way. It just takes you to this sort of magical kind of world, I guess. And it's not like, uh, it, it just, I don't know, when you kind of bring that concept to mind, it, it really sounds like the, the perfect soundtrack. You can sort of just imagine this sort of, I don't know, like this sort of like gleaming ball of light just kind of traversing the landscapes as it makes its way through forests, down rivers, up mountains, down mountains, and over hills and everything until it finally finds its its true resting place, which is, you know, whatever the afterlife is. I mean, the afterlife is, you know, 
differ in every man's mind, but you know, this is a uh, the spirit is trying to find that place, and who knows? I mean, maybe when we do die, we do have to search that place out. Maybe it's not just presented to us in you know in the kind of like the way like the Bible and all the other creation books kind of you know presented to us. Maybe it's not so simple. Maybe it actually is this long journey we have to go on to actually get there. Me being someone that's, you know, takes a lot of uh, inspiration from the natural world, I can kind of really get down at that concept. I mean, it really seems like a tangible thing where, like, when we die, we do have to go on this journey to find what, is, you know, the afterlife is. And the afterlife is, you know, different in every man's heart. It could be anything, you know, everyone's different. So, and that, this, this uh, spirit, it has to find that afterlife. And that's the whole thing with this album. It's really interesting. And, I mean, I don't think I've ever really come across that theme in dark ambient music, or really music in general, so it's a pretty unique thing. Musically, this record is just rich with field recordings, and it's all these recordings are made in the natural, and it just, uh, as you journey through this album, it, uh, you get to you know, hear all these natural field recordings, and it really takes that place, you can just close your eyes and drift away to that place. And I mean, I've already done that a number of times, though, just listen to this album when I'm relaxing, when I'm reading something, you know, when I'm just passing this sleep, it really takes me to this special world, and you know, like I always say, there's not a lot of albums that can do that, but this is, you know, with self-release new artists are doing it, and that's really awesome, so to me that says this guy's really onto something special, and he's really just taking his time and coming in, you know, taking in that all in, just, you know, at a time, making sure everything's perfect before he uh, releases music, which is great. There's also a lot of really great piano melodies on this record, I mean, nothing that sounds like super complex to my ear, but it just really accents the record great and it just really adds this sort of, uh, I don't know, just really peaceful and just a uh, lovely kind of sound to the album. It just, I mean, it's, it's very much, you know, reminiscent of, I would say, like some of the pianos you'd see in like a North Haunt record or something like that. Uh, you know, it's uh, also, of course, you know, there's a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the dark droning soundscapes, but the record itself isn't really dark in like that sort of like nightmarish way that we're, we're kind of more accustomed to in dark gaming music. No, I mean, I would say this record actually has more of that sort of like post-rock feeling where it's like kind of like bleak, but also there's always that like looming optimism, and you really get a lot in that record. And I mean, it, it, it makes sense too when you take the concept in mind that it's, you know, a soul that's just left its host after suicide and it's slowly getting closer to its goal, which is the afterlife. Crossing is a really great record, and I mean, this is the album, like I said, just takes you through snowy fields, up mountains, down mountains, over hills, and far beyond, you know, it's just, uh, it's great, I love it, I mean, I've, it's been a really long time since I came across a self-release soul artist that just really blew me away this much, but I mean, I'm glad, to say, thanks to, like, social media, you know, I was able to get in contact with this guy, you know, it's great, I mean, we actually came into contact, uh, by Instagram, I had sort of, uh, noticed this guy was always, uh, liking my posts on uh, Instagram, and I just looked at his profile one day, and I was like, oh, he makes music, and I started to listen to it, and I really liked the first few songs, and then I got in contact with him, and asked him if he wanted to do a trade for my first album called Back to the Mud, and he, much to my surprise, was actually already familiar with my music, but he wanted to do the trade, which is great, and since then we've formed a nice friendship, and I think we're going to collaborate on some stuff in the future, too, so it's really exciting, I mean, that's just, you know, one of the great things I like about the Dark Yammy community, too, there is a lot of brotherhood, a lot of, uh, you know, there's no, I don't really detect much arrogance or, you know, not one, not one single person trying to lead the scene so much, really. It's a lot of just, a lot of people got each other's backs, a lot of people motivate each other. That's really great, because, you know, you don't really get that in, like, you don't really get that in heavy metal too much. There's always so much division, you know, so, but that's the thing about heavy metal. It's There's always so many topics discussed and everything, you know, it's, I don't know, and people have always the opinions of what a metalhead is supposed to look like and all that kind of stuff, so whatever, that's another story I can took entirely, of course, but uh, like I was saying, you know, just a lot of great uh, brotherhood and dark and music, and it's great that, you know, in nowadays technology, we can come into contact with each other, we can, you know, give each other props on our, on our, our music, we can collaborate easily and just, you know, uh, be friends, you know, so it's really great. So Crossing is a self-released affair, and uh, the first thing that really struck me about this record is that uh, for a self-released album, it is extraordinarily professional. I mean, the packaging comes in this wonderful digipack with a pull-out booklet, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, it is on a CDR, but, you know, it's got the disc print, so who really cares? I mean, I'm not really so anal about it as long as it's actually on a physical medium, which it is. 
Um, the DigiPack looks great. It's also mastered by Robert Rich, who some of you probably know. I mean, he's a pretty legendary dude in the like, experimental electronic and the ambient, dark ambient scene. I mean, that's a guy that's been going at it for, what, 25, 30 years probably? So it's really cool. So, I mean, you know the mastery and just the sound's going to be really spot on. Editing some of the earlier segments of this uh, episode, I kind of realized I wasn't really doing a good job of showing the artwork. So from here on, I want to just really make sure I'm showing the, you know, a good, good close-ups of the artwork and everything. And since the artwork and the photography of just the whole lives, I'm so good. I wanted to make sure everyone saw it. So here's the front cover of Infinix Huma's album, The Crossing. Open up the digitex. There's the CD. Underneath the CD. Uh, see, it's made out to not to looking and from. In the and uh, this side of the Digifact, there's a bio that kind of just guides you through the whole concept of the story and what's going on, and a little bit of what the artist has done in the past. Back cover, of course, with all those track listings. It has this really nice whole uh, book, which has uh, a slew of really great photos in it. Of course, all of these photos were taken in the Pacific Northwest area, which is where Infinite Cuma calls home. Really great layout. I mean, for a self-released album, like I said, I, I would say that's about as pro as you can get. I mean, that looks like it's like something you'd see on uh, any you know professional label, if not even better. Um, as a final thought, I, uh, I like I said, I'm pretty blown away by this album. I know he's already working on a second album, and I am very much looking forward to that. Uh, but in the meanwhile, this album will continue to get lots of plays for me. I know that for sure. And. Uh, should definitely look it up on Bandcamp. I mean, he's selling it for only 10 bucks, and I mean, this is, as I said, super professional, right down from the music to the layout to the mastering, the, the packaging is great. So, I mean, uh, definitely one of the better albums I've heard in the past several months, and I mean, if you're into just really uh, posty, dark ambient music, this is a record I think you're really going to get into. I mean, this is unique stuff, and I love it, I and mean, it's great. So, as Infinexuma's Crossing. That'll about do it for episode 4 guys, and I always have to thank you for watching, giving that thumbs up thing on YouTube, and the commentary and everything, it really means a lot to me. Um, yeah, I know there's a few missteps this time around, but maybe the next episode will be a little bit more pure dark ambient, uh, in case you were offended or anything like that, what is going on. Uh, and, uh, like I mentioned in the last segment too, if, uh, you're into, uh, you know, Instagram. I do have an Instagram account. I mostly post, like, dark ambient stuff or music stuff in general and uh, dark grim stuff. <laughs> There's also uh, cute cats here and there and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So if you're into Instagram, which I suddenly have gotten really into just lately, uh, check it out and uh, look up Insta uh, look up Noctilook on Instagram and you will find me. Or maybe I can just go like that and it'll magically appear on your screen. I'm not gonna go with that and we'll make it magically appear. Stop scratching Jasper. Stop scratching Jasper. This is Jasper, one of uh, many cats that reside here with me and my woman. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys as always for watching, and uh, it means a lot to me. And uh, I will be back sooner than later with more dark ambient stuff. All right, till next time. Bye.